Um, Lawrence Kirk, um, thank you, uh, coming down from Oxford. Um, Lawrence used to, he used to work for banks, but then he left um, to explore opportunities around Ethereum. Uh, his own consultancy is called Extropy. Uh, extrap.io. Um, so he's helping, uh, you know, he's advising people on uh, on uh, possibilities around developing uh, Ethereum-based solutions. Um, and he's here tonight to give all of us a presentation, uh, everything we need to go for, uh, need to know from a, a beginner's perspective. So over to Lawrence. Hi. Thank you. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? The better. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, thank you everybody for coming. Um, Thank you for avoiding the lure of the Hyperledger talk as well and staying with us. Um, right, what I want to talk about tonight, I'm going to start off talking about the components of blockchain chain technology because um, I, I don't know how much you all know about blockchain, what sort of level you're at, but it's, that's a useful introduction. And if you want to understand Ethereum, you have to understand, um, and if you want to understand why Ethereum is special, you need to understand what uh, special put, uh, parts of uh, that technology make Ethereum special. I'll then go on to looking at Ethereum itself and uh, how to write distributed applications. Unfortunately, I can't uh, do a demo of the cryptocurrency tonight. We don't have Wi-Fi. Uh, I don't have my laptop talking to the projector, so I'll just have to talk about that. Um, we'll have to do that another time. Finally, I'll talk about the implications um, that Ethereum will bring to the web and uh, businesses and society. So let's start off. Just a quick uh, description of Ethereum. Um, it's a decentralized platform that runs smart contracts um, and they run exactly as programmed. Um, that's all you need to know about it at this stage. Um, if, you're, if you're used to Bitcoin, which I think most of you are, it's useful to think how it differs from Bitcoin. So it's much more general than Bitcoin. It's not just a currency. It's a general platform for writing applications. Um, as with uh, Bitcoin, it's, uh, the system consists of nodes, but each node has a virtual machine that runs smart contracts. And transactions are sent to these nodes uh, and uh, call functions on the smart contracts. If you go to sleep uh, during this talk and forget everything that I've said, please just remember two things. One, there's no central authority, and the second thing, Everything is all about trust. That's the kind of the problem we're aiming to solve. So having said that, if you want to fall asleep, you know, go ahead, but please don't snore. Okay. Um, just to say a little bit about this issue of trust. Um, it's, we have all these uh, systems, uh, institutions in place, uh, all societies do, to provide trust between individuals and, and companies. Um, one of the problems that the blockchain is trying to solve is to uh, get around that, to, to uh, reduce the amount of, of trust that people need before they can interact with each other. Uh, the quote there from Gavin Wood, who is one of the uh, inventors of Ethereum. Um, okay. So there are three components that I'd like to talk about initially um, that make Ethereum special. Um, so the first one is peer-to-peer -peer networking. Second, the blockchain data structure itself and the mechanism that it uses. And third, cryptography. Now these three components are uh, components of blockchain in general. It's not special to Ethereum, but it's useful to understand what uh, properties these have, because then you'll better understand how Ethereum is special. So if you look at peer-to-peer -peer networks, um, they're decentralized. That's my Main thing to remember, if you've forgotten, there's no central authority. That means they're censorship proof. If a government is doing a peer network, it's very, very difficult for it to stop you doing that. And uh, that also means it's highly reliable. If one of the nodes on the network fails for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. Transactions, messages can still pass around the network. And some examples of where this is used at the moment, or has been used, Napster, BitTorrent, Justify, I think we're all probably fairly familiar with peer-to-peer with, uh, -peer networks. The blockchain itself, the data structure, you can think of it as a public ledger. All transactions that happen in the system are seen by everybody. Um, and the state of the system at any point is arrived at by consensus. So this is true for Bitcoin, for any cryptocurrency, it's true for Ethereum. Thirdly, we're relying on cryptography. 
um, public private key cryptography we all use this every day in for our uh, credit cards whatever but this means that any transactions we do are tamper proof we, um, and the origin of a transaction can be verif verified we can say that this transaction came from this account because that account has a private key we know it came from them obviously uh, there is pseudonymity so we don't know who that account might belong to in the real world but we can be sure that it came from a particular account and the last part there was just to, um, in case anybody wants to know how accounts are created in ethereum um, I, that was one of the questions I wanted to know about Bitcoin is how do you how do you create an account how do you get your account number they're created at random but the numbers are so big that it just doesn't matter and there's no chance of a clash uh, similarly with ethereum they are um, and they throw away some of the bits and you get an account address on ethereum okay so in summary the peer-to-peer -peer network means we've got a censorship resistant platform to work with the blockchain itself means it's we have transparency, we can verify that the transactions are valid. The state of the system is arrived at by consensus. Cryptography means that we have tamper-proof transactions. If you bring those features together, that increases the trust that people can have in the system. We can have confidence in interacting with people across a uh, blockchain system without needing some central authority to provide that trust. Uh, for example, if you, if you think about Bitcoin, if you wanted to send somebody some money, if you go out into the street and give somebody some cash, say, please give it to my friend, well, you'd never see it again. But you, you rely on that. You're, you're happy for, say, Bitcoin to do that. The Bitcoin system can pass your value around um, without you being concerned who, who that's going through. You do have trust in that system. Okay. Now, Ethereum is different uh, from uh, Bitcoin, as I said, it's more general um, and it allows you to write distributed applications. The name that people have come up with for these uh, applications are smart contracts, or these are small pieces of code and they live on the Ethereum blockchain. They, they have a particular address on the blockchain so that you can reference them and they have um, what I call here a balance so they can own their own currency. They can, uh, typically they receive transactions, but they can also send them. And they are, they are activated when they receive a transaction. They can be killed to some extent, but typically with the blockchain, if something's on the blockchain, it's on there for good. Um, so the, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine runs a Turing complete language. There's a number of languages you can use. Um, I'll explain more about the fees later on. And it's useful to remember that when you're when you're running um, a smart contract, you can run that on your local copy of the blockchain. So everybody, every client who's on the Ethereum system has their own copy of the blockchain. They, have, uh, they receive all the transactions, they update their own version of the, of the blockchain. They can, uh, when they receive a transaction, and they do, they will update their own copy. Now, if you need to update if you need to update the blockchain, you need to obviously pass that around. That transaction needs to go to everybody so they can update their own copies. If you only need to read a value from the blockchain, then you don't need to send a transaction around. So you can just read a value from your, your own blockchain um, without using a transaction. And that will, we'll see how that's important later on. So if you look at a, an Ethereum node, um, typically they say it has a virtual machine. It will have a number of smart contracts in it. A transaction will come in and call a function on one of these smart contracts and that will update the state of the blockchain that you have. That transaction is distributed around the network and updates, it calls the, fun the same function on every node which updates their own uh, personal contract. If you like to imagine, if you imagine all of you tonight were represented a node on the Ethereum network, if you imagine that you all had your laptop, that would be like the, the virtual machine and you are being given a transaction, perhaps some, some instruction about what to do, and you're updating perhaps a spreadsheet on your laptop. That is sort of a good analogy, I think, for understanding how the Ethereum system works. And when I first, when I first heard this, I thought this was incredibly wasteful, because I come from a background of low latency systems, and it seemed to me ridiculous that every node on the network would be doing exactly the same thing, coming up with the same result. And it is ridiculous in a sense. It's extremely inefficient. Um, you are doing exactly the same thing. 
the point is that you're building a consensus so that every node, they can check what uh, the transaction is, they can verify it, they can build their own their blockchain, and there is a consensus built across the whole system about what the state of the system is. And that's what makes Ethereum special, and that's why this is useful. If you want to write uh, smart contracts, there are a number of languages you can use. The most popular one is called Solidity, and that looks a little bit like JavaScript. Uh, there's an, this second most popular, Serpent, is Python-like. Mutan is not under development anymore. I think it's pretty much dead. Um, and the Lisp-like one is, I think is still used occasionally. Um, if you're a Lisp fan and um, you like brackets, then good luck with that. Um, basically, uh, all of these languages, uh, there's a compiler for them, and they compile into bytecode, which then is run on the, the virtual machine, on the virtual uh, Ethereum virtual machine on each node. To give you an example of how this might work, you can imagine a, a voting application. Imagine you have some people who want to vote on some proposal. Um, each person would have an account in Ethereum. They would call a function on the smart contract to register their vote. That would update a value in the smart contract containing the count of votes that any particular proposal had. Um, so they just send each transaction in, it goes around the network, and each uh, node on the network updates their own copy of the blockchain with the, the number of votes cast. If you want to know, uh, and, and the smart contract can then uh, react to the, after a certain time and say who, who the winner is. If you want to know what that looks like, this is uh, Solidity code. If you, um, this is given as an example in a tutorial. I'll try and explain some of what it is. It's, uh, this isn't the uh, whole amount of the code, but over here, the, uh, these are the, um, this is the storage. Uh, this is the variables that you have in memory. So this is containing the information that you're going to update. Um, the rest of it here, we have some functions you can run. This function here has the same name as the contract, and that is a constructor. If you're familiar with object-oriented programs, you will know what uh, constructors are. This function runs when the contract is deployed, and so sets up the default values for the contract. Um, the function uh, vote here is the, the one we're interested in. So you would send a transaction to this contract, specifying which proposal you wanted to vote for, and it would record uh, the details of your vote in the, in the structures over here, in the storage, and uh, may send back uh, some values just to say you've done that. Um, at the end of it, um, you can check which is the winning, which, which is the winning proposal. Um, now, what I was saying before, there's the, the idea that you can send transactions or you could just look at, for some data in your local copy of the blockchain. This function here is marked as constant. That means that uh, the, it's not going to update the blockchain in any way. Therefore, you can just read the values here uh, from your local blockchain. You don't need to process this around the network. You're not, you don't need a consensus for that. Um, so you can just read the, the winning proposal from there. Now, one problem that you may have thought of um, about this is um, what happens if you're a malicious person, you write a malicious smart contract, you put it onto the blockchain, it has a function in there which has an infinite loop in it. What would happen then is people would call that function, their virtual machine would just go into an infinite loop, stop, or perhaps it would, uh, you try to send it a huge amount of storage or you would try to update a huge amount of memory, you would, you know, you'd be doing a denial of service attack effectively on the whole network. You could just stop the whole thing. The way to get around this is the, by the use of what they call gas. So every operation that uh, runs in the virtual machine is, uh, uses a certain amount of gas. This is like a transaction fee, in effect. So uh, when you send a transaction to Ethereum, you say up front, I'm going to pay this amount of, um, as a transaction fee. I'm prepared to pay this amount of, of gas. 
when the transaction runs in the virtual machine, each time an instruction, each time an operation is executed, it costs a certain amount of gas, and each instruction has, has a different price. Um, it, that takes that out of the gas that you've paid up front. If the if the amount of gas you've paid, the whole th the virtual steam machine stops that function, rolls it back, and stop that that effectively would stop any uh, problems with an infinite loop. Um, obviously, uh, there is a, a limit to the amount of gas that you're allowed to to supply up front. It used to be a million pi. It's gone up a little bit now, slightly more. Um, in ether, in any way, um, but yeah, it's a certain amount. So you have to be prepared to make this transaction cost up front when you when you run a transaction. I was hoping we could do a demo of creating a crypt cryptocurrency um, for us tonight. Unfortunately, we don't have Wi-Fi, and, and my laptop wouldn't talk to the projector properly, so we can't do it. Um, it's incredibly simple. So you're used to uh, Bitcoin. That's uh, the currency that's been that you know. In Ethereum, you can create that in just a few lines of code. Um, it just takes a few minutes to, to deploy that. Um, it is a very simple thing. It's actually, if you go to the Ethereum or website, look at their tutorials. It's the first tutorial they have is to create a cryptocurrency. Um, it's a lot of fun. I would encourage you all to do it. You can make yourself millionaires in your own little coin overnight. Um, all you have to do then is get somebody else to, to buy them. Um, if you want to write uh, some uh, some code, there are a number of IDEs. It's still uh, the there's still a lot of uh, development on going on in this area. This one is called um, EtherCamp. Um, a little bit unfocused, unfortunately, um, but it's quite uh, a well developed IDE. You can write uh, it. It is, acts as a compiler. Um, it also uh, has um, some support for JavaScript, so you can write your front end as well. On the right-hand side there, it has its own little sort of dummy blockchain, so you can, you can write some code, you can deploy it, you can look at what it's doing on the blockchain, and it's not bad. Um, it runs um, on Cloud9, um, so it's its own virtual machine. Um, at the moment, it is free. Uh, they did plan originally to get you to pay for it. I think they've changed their mind. They're going to keep it free for the time being. Um, so if you're interested, go to ether.camp um, and try that one out. It's, it's quite quite functional. Um, another one is Truffle, um, it's, which has a good uh, testing framework. Um, works with uh, and, um, yeah, and Mocker and, and Chai. Um, it's generally a command line thing, so you need your own IDE to, to, to start using it. Um, the one that uh, comes from the Ethereum organization is called Mix. Um, to say that I have a, a love-hate relationship with it is more of a, a hate-hate relationship, really. Um, I get endless problems um, trying to get this thing to compile and, and work nicely. Um, it's also rather counterintuitive in the way that you uh, create your applications and test them. But it's worth trying. Um, again, on the left-hand side there, you see you have some contract. Uh, on the right-hand side, it has its own little dummy blockchain uh, that you can deploy to. Once you've finished testing it on that, you can then try deploying it to uh, the real world. Um, the one um, I was hoping to, to demonstrate, I, I, well, I can't because we don't have internet access, is there's an online Solidity compiler. It's browser-based. Um, you just type in your Solidity code. It compiles it. It gives you bytecode. And you can just uh, copy and paste that into your own uh, node in, in Ethereum. That's the one that I use. Um, it's very basic, but it means that it doesn't go wrong. Um, yeah, I would recommend looking at that. Um, it's very good. It just, it just works. That's the online Solidity compiler. Online. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's browser-based and it just this works fine. It has its own little browser-based uh, virtual machine that you can use. You can then connect to a, a running node on Ethereum and deploy from there into the into the running node. Yeah. So Ethereum have a, a larger uh, vision um, rather than just being smart contracts. They have the couple of other uh, areas they're looking at. Um, neither of these uh, are complete yet. Um, the first one is Swarm. 
um, which is there for storing data, uh, and then WISP is for messaging. One of the problems with Ethereum um, that you'll find is, as I mentioned, you have this, this concept of gas. So everything you want to do, you've got to, you've got to pay for up front. If you want to store anything, it's extremely expensive. Generally speaking, if you want to uh, write a, an Ethereum application, don't store or store as little as possible uh, on the blockchain. Um, store just use that for um, where it, you need to have it on the blockchain for whatever uh, special purpose the blockchain has. But um, keep things off blockchain if possible. A good technology stack that people have come up with is to use Ethereum, and uh, there's a, a platform called IPFS. Um, Swarm is another uh, thing that's similar to IPFS. Um, and it's a distributed storage system. So um, this is under development at the moment. As I say, it's not complete, but it means that you can store vast amounts of data cheaply, um, whereas you can't really do that if storing it on the Ethereum blockchain um, because that would just cost you a huge amount of gas. And you can understand why that is, because if you try to, if you try to upload a movie into Ethereum, then every, every node on the network would have to then download that movie. Again, you're, it's a denial, denial of service attack, effectively, you're doing. Whisper is a uh, yeah, messaging, messaging system. Uh, it's meant to be anonymous and secure, um, but again, it's not complete yet. Um, watch your space. Um, so why would you think about using Ethereum? Um, it's great for uptime. You have a peer-to-peer -peer network. If a node goes down, it just doesn't matter. You can just pretty much guarantee that your application will always be there. You store it on the blockchain, the blockchain is not going to go away. Um, if a government doesn't like what you've done, well, what can they do about it? Um, it's pretty much always going to be there. Um, conversely, be careful what you put on the blockchain because it's always going to be there. Um, the security is good. It's as good as the security you're going to be using for uh, your credit card transactions. Um, if quantum computing comes along, uh, that could be problematic. If personally, I'm going to be more worried about my bank than I am about Ethereum if that happens. Um, but there are people have been looking at this, and there are ways around this. It's once you've deployed your application to Ethereum, it's effectively free to run. So, I mean, a lot of people. I don't know about you, but a lot of people will may use something like Amazon um, to to host the application, and they will pay a fee for for using their cloud service. Um, they pay a monthly fee or whatever. If you use Ethereum, once you've deployed to the blockchain, that's it. You don't pay another fee for, to keep it there. It's, it's there, that's it. Um, the, your users uh, of your application may pay a fee because they, they're paying a transaction fee. But that's good for your business because that means you're only having to pay that fee when your application is being used. So it's, it's a great business model for masses. Transparency, if you're wondering whether you can trust a particular application, well, go and look at the code. Um, there are, people are encouraged when they deploy um, Ethereum applications to put the code, uh, open source the code so that people can see what it is. If they don't do that, well, it makes it more difficult. But you can go to the blockchain, you can look at the byte code, you can find someone technical who will be able to go through that and say, yes, this does X, Y, Z. Um, so you know, this should give you confidence in what the application is doing. At the moment, we, we tend to trust Facebook or Amazon or whoever for, for no particular reason, just because we, we, we do trust them. Um, with Ethereum, we can actually go and see what is actually running. And we can know that it hasn't been hacked. Um, you could get the, the, the source code, uh, compile it, check it against the bytecode on the blockchain. Uh, it's good for micropayments. So the, um, the currency that Ethereum uses, Ether, um, can be split down to um, the smallest denomination is called a way, and that's uh, there are 10 to the 18 of those in one ether. So if you want to buy a significantly small fraction of something, you can do that. Um, so similar to Bitcoin, if that makes sense. Uh, DAOs and um, consensus applications, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, um, and yeah, identity and reputation services, I'll, I'll come on to as well. Um, I'm not someone who believes that this is a, uh, going to solve all the world's problems. It has limitations. So generally, the virtual machine is slow. Um, your smart contract is going to run slowly. It's not. Uh, if you're thinking about, say, 
training machine learning on it, well, don't. It's, you know, you're wasting your time. It's, you do straightforward things, it's not going to be fast. That's not why you're using Ethereum. Um, as I said, storage is expensive. Um, use IPFS instead. Um, nobody's asked me what IPFS is. It stands for Interplanetary File System. It's a decentralized storage system. Uh, again, once you put something on there, it's there for good. So be careful what you put on there. Um, but I would encourage you all to look at that as well. If you want to host a website on that, it's a good way of doing it as well. Scalability is an issue. Um, we've seen scalability problems with Bitcoin. People are talking about scalability uh, with Ethereum. It is something that is actively being looked at. Um, there is generally a trade-off. Um, if you want a decentralized blockchain, that is, there you do have a trade-off with um, performance. Um, so the way around this is you could you can create your own blockchains. You could have a private blockchain that only a few people use, that have a limited number of transactions, but then you lose the, the public aspect. But scalability is an issue. You need to think about that. Um, and private blockchains, yeah, they're allowed, they're going to proliferate. Um, we've seen um, banks are getting together in consortiums. They're jumping on this because it helps with their clearance, um, but they're likely just to use their blockchains for their own purposes. They're not going to let just anybody join in, and they're going to limit the, the amount of transactions on that. So what are implications of it? Um, as I said before, remember, there is no central authority. We don't need some third-party intermediary to stand between me and someone that, I'm trying, someone that I'm trying to buy something from to show that I can trust them. This is quite a significant thing. Um, we can resolve, um, we can process payments, we can resolve things by the system itself rather than having to have somebody in between. Um, the great word disintermediation um, is going to be quite powerful, I think, this idea. Um, as I say, there's going to be people who are going to be worried about this, it's going to be middlemen. So, if you use Kickstarter to set up your business, they take a fee. I think at least 5%, it could be more. Some people have quoted 20%, whatever. If you want to do a do crowdfund your startup on Ethereum, you can do that. It's extremely simple to write. It's one of the tutorials on Ethereum is how to do this. You can write your own crowdfunding smart contract, get it onto the blockchain, Ethereum blockchain. It's there. People can start to use it. They will pay a fraction of a cent for each... Uh, each transaction they want to do, but it's effectively free. You don't pay anybody a fee. That a smart contract itself will do everything that Kickstarter can do. So we don't need Kickstarter. There was a, I was looking at a, an election system, a voting system at the end of last year. I saw this thing called OpaVote. They charge $500. I don't need to do that now. I can write my, my own thing. I can write a smart contract to do that. Effectively, it's free. Uber, Amazon, we can replace all of these people. Any kind of agency, we can replace those kind of people. I loathe recruitment agencies. I've been contracting in IT, and I've had to go through them. I absolutely loathe them. It gives me a great deal of pleasure and hope that one day we, I won't have to do that. Um, estate agents, perhaps we'll be able to replace those. People generally don't like them. Um, we shall see. Um, meetup. I have to pay a fee to Meetup to run uh, the Oxford Ethereum group. Why should I have to do that? I could do all of the functionality from that on an Ethereum smart contract. Um, because of transparency, because everybody can see transactions, if you're involved in corruption, this is probably a bad, going to be a bad time for you. Um, for this reason, it's great for voting systems or for systems that can, you can use to prove your ownership of things. So if you can reduce the amount of corruption in the world, that would be good. Typically, just any centralized business and organization, they could be impacted by Ethereum. Now, I'm, uh, like I say, I'm, I don't want to be uh, too idealistic about this. Um, this is going to take time. It's, uh, it will happen in stages, but it could be very powerful, I believe. Something that uh, has got a lot of news, going to be in the news a lot lately, decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs. 
So they're a very interesting idea, and uh, they come about because we have this, these, these features of the blockchain that does allow us to uh, do, uh, run smart contracts, allow us to do a particular point, kind of business. The idea for a DAO is that your business will be run according to rules that are specified in a smart contract. So instead of having board members who will decide how to run your business, how to so you go for crowdfunding, how to distribute dividends, you will have a, a contract living on the Ethereum blockchain that does it. The, additionally, you will, the DAO will probably have some sort of uh, property, maybe some currency or something of value that it owns, um, that it can then, that then will be used. Um, people can, uh, anybody can see because of the transparency of this and the smart contracts, any, any outsider can see how this, con how this company is being run. Um, if you're involved with any companies at the moment, you, do you go and look at their constitutions? Do you check those out? Is, do you know that they're being followed? If you, if you have a, a on the blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain, you can see exactly what they're going to do. There will be no surprises. Um, there are quite clever ways that the the, uh, the DAO can make decisions. It may be that it will ask for voting uh, among shareholders, or it may use prediction markets to do that. Um, one uh, an example, if you want a, a sort of an easy example for this, I was thinking of was if you had a, a company that, uh, say, wanted to set up a do insurance. So you could start up your insurance smart contract. You could get shareholders to send you some to buy shares in your uh, in your DAO and that would give your DAO a large capital. Uh, then the smart contract may say that it's going to insure its clients against say bad weather. The clients would pay a premium to the contract and the contract would keep that. Uh, again no people are involved here it's just the calling a function on the contract. The uh, contracts could get information from outside uh, about the weather. If it rains on your parade, then you can be compensated the, by the contract itself. The contract could make the payout to the person. Again, no people have been involved in any of this. Any profit that the contract makes, it could then, every six months, pay as dividends to its shareholders. These are very interesting uh, from all sorts of perspectives. Um, at the moment, the legality of these uh, is very nebulous. Um, so, if I set up a DAO today and the British government decides they want me to pay some tax for that, well, good luck to them. How they go, for a start, how they're going to know that I did it. Um, I can set it up from an account, so they don't know who that account belongs to. Generally, if you set up a DAO on the Ethereum blockchain, what legal jurisdiction does that fall under? Um, you know, which which country does that originate from, really? The transaction might start in a particular country, but is that where the DAO is based? Who knows? If the government, or any government, doesn't like what your DAO is doing, what are they going to do about it? It's there on the blockchain. It will last for as long as the blockchain does. It will continue to function for as long as the blockchain does. These are very interesting, very powerful ideas. and. At some point, the, these will be tested in law, I guess. Um, it will be very interesting to see what happens. When that happens, it will be interesting to see how governments and lawyers try to do something about these things. The news um, that you'll probably be aware of and where you may have heard of DAOs is because of this. The DAO, or the DAO Hub, as people call it, um, has just finished its crowdfunding, I think, a couple of days ago. Um, it is the largest crowdfunded, uh, last crowd, largest crowdfunding in history. Um, I got these stats yesterday. It said there was, it had raised $132 million, which is pretty good going, I think. Um, there's a lot of interest in this. Um, what it's going to do with that money now, uh, it's going to be interesting. The idea is that the, the shareholders, so the people who've bought, who have founded this, who have bought DAO tokens, will then be able to vote on how they want that money uh, to be uh, distributed, to be uh, used for funding other projects. 
and the, there will be a, a consensus built about, about how the money will be invested. But there has been uh, a call for a moratorium about this because some people have said that there are security issues. So they've said, please don't use this at the moment. Um, there are going to be problems. This is all new technology, um, so we shouldn't really be surprised. Um, uh, one of the problems I think people have seen is that you, you could create this massive crowd fund, you can create, get all this money into your DAO, and then get all your friends to come in to vote so that you all spend that money on yourselves, or throw a big party, or put it into a particular fund that you own. Yeah. There are lots of issues around this that, that need to be resolved. Um, so do watch this space um, over the next few days and weeks. Uh, this is going to be very interesting, uh, what happens to this $132 million. Um, another area that uh, Ethereum is going to be very useful for, governance. So it's great for if you're looking for a voting system, uh, because of the transparency, because everybody can see uh, what's happened. It's going to be very difficult for people to uh, get involved with corruption. Um, the actual mechanisms of voting about who wins the election will be written into the smart contract. So the people who vote can then be confident in the, how that uh, voting will be done. These are some uh, th theories and ideas that people have come up with. Um, I won't go to, into any of them uh, in particular, but uh, again, this is, there's a lot of possibilities that, uh, that could be developed around the democracy and bringing together people into organisations simply and allowing them to vote on proposals. Um, certainly, it's, if you're interested in creating uh, um, any kind of organisations, it's worth looking at. The question you should be asking when you see some new technology is this a lot of hype? Um, you're probably You've probably seen this curve before. Um, I think uh, at the moment we're probably you know, heading on this sort of area, um, coming towards the peak um, of this. I've spoken to people who've said that this is, uh, that this is um, at a, a, a larger peak than um, they've seen before, so they're expecting the trough to be to be larger too. I'm waiting for it to, to come through to the other side. It's going to be good when we get there, but wait and see. Um, yes, there's a lot of hype about, but yes, um, it's, this has a lot of potential. Um, so it's not all hype. If you want to look at who are people are using Ethereum, this is a, uh, just a quick breakdown. Um, a lot of people in infrastructure at the moment, a lot of applications in infrastructure. Um, but there's just a wide range of uh, applications at the moment. So, um, as you would expect, currencies, but also uh, yeah, we've got gaming there, financial services, and banks are really all over this and throwing a lot of money at this at the moment. Um, these are some companies that uh, are using Ethereum at the moment. I think you had a talk a couple of weeks ago from Colony, so I won't talk about them. Augur, I, I like. Um, prediction markets are interesting. Uh, go and have a look at them. They're, they're a great idea. Augur are doing that on the blockchain. Provenance have been held up as a great use of Ethereum. They uh, are using uh, the blockchain to provide transparency about supply chains. Um, Baker, an autonomous bank, a market maker. UJ Music, I like UJ because this is quite a different um, idea to a lot of the, the applications. A lot of applications at the moment are in the financial area. So UJ are looking at the artistic side of things. They have uh, looking at using the blockchain to um, streamline royalty payments to artists. Um, and I imagine Heap was working with them. Um, so that's, that's good to see. Uh, these are some more, I won't go into them in any Transactive Grid, they're looking at uh, allowing you to sell your energy to, to your neighbours or whoever, if you have solar panels. Um, Autonomous are a good uh, company. If you want to set up uh, your company uh, very simply, you can just go to them. They will put it on a blockchain. Um, IoT and Ethereum is a good, a good mix. Um, you may well have heard of Slockit. They are... 
uh, really leading the field in a lot of ways. They're doing a lot of, uh, they're driving a lot of the publicity behind Ethereum. Um, they drive a lot of the publicity behind the DAO that was that was um, that's just been crowdfunded. Their idea is that they uh, their IoT device is a lock, and then you can use that to lock, say, an apartment, and then rent out that apartment, and people will be allowed access to uh, via the smart contracts that so they'll they will access it via their account. Um, but the the possibilities can much wider than that. Generally, the IoT area is great for, for the blockchain. If you have an IoT device and you want it to have some rules, um, if it's, it will have to be have an internet connection, obviously. So why not put give it a smart contract on the blockchain? Uh, you could imagine this situation where you have, say, a solar panel that is generating some energy. It has its own smart contract. It sells its energy to people. The profits from that go into that small contract, smart contract uh, as, as Ether into its balance. If it needs repairing, it can send out a message and pay for a repairer to come out and repair it. And that's it. It effectively owns its own, it's its own company. It owns its own money, it just does its own thing. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of potential there for the IT side. Okay, I couldn't resist this, given the... Uh, <laughs> Given uh, what's happened uh, tonight, okay, Hyperledger. So um, I don't know a great deal about Hyperledger. I have to say it's uh, it's a new, a new thing, a new uh, idea. Um, a consortium has been built. Uh, IBM, uh, Linux Foundation, uh, some banks have got together um, to produce Hyperledger. Um, they are. I think the idea is that they are looking very much about the scalability side of things. They are focusing on uh, how uh, the blockchain is going to be used, uh, particularly perhaps in the, the finance industry, where um, you'll be looking very much at very uh, quick transactions. Um, but they are still at a, quite an early stage. They're not as advanced as Ethereum. Um, but what they come up with in, in terms of scalability will be interesting. And it's, it's an issue that you know, the, the community as a whole will, is going to have to look at. Um, we do need to solve these problems. Um, you finished taking your photo? Okay. <laughs> so, where are we going on uh, well, next steps? Okay, the first thing, and the one that people will often ask questions about. Um, if you know a little bit about Bitcoin, uh, how it works, uh, it has a consensus protocol called proof of work. And if you've, you should all have heard of proof of work because of uh, the company. Uh, <laughs> I hope you've heard of it. Um, so. Uh, at the moment, Ethereum uses the same uh, mechanism uh, for providing the consensus uh, for, for the blockchain. It's a very simple uh, means of arriving at a consensus. It's very straightforward. Um, you do a very expensive computation and it's effectively a race. Whichever person wins that race gets a reward. But it is computationally very expensive. Um, the amount of uh, electricity that's being used around the world to do this on the Bitcoin network, I've heard is as much as uh, some small country uh, uses. So I've heard different countries, so maybe an urban myth about that, but it's a vast amount of electricity. Um, from a green point of view, it would be better to move to something different. Ethereum wants to move to something called proof of stake. Um, unfortunately, this is much more complex. Um, the, the final version of this hasn't been uh, arrived at, I don't think. Um, so, um, but it is going to come. Um, the idea of this is going to be that people will effectively have a stake. They'll put up a stake in uh, when they are doing mining. Um, and uh, if they prove to be a malicious person uh, trying to subvert the network, then they will lose their stake. And that is, that is how the, the network is protected from malicious which is people. Um, that will come sometime soon. Um, it will probably take a while for that to, to iron out all the faults. It is more complex than proof of work, but hopefully we will get there and we won't need such, uh, to use so much electricity. One idea that would, that's uh, been proposed to get around some of the problems of performance, uh, scalability, is the idea of sharding. So 
we write our applications on the Ethereum blockchain. At the moment, there is one blockchain. Every transaction, every application goes onto the same blockchain. There are about a million and a half blocks at the moment, um, but every type of uh, transact, every type of application that you write goes onto the same blockchain. There's the idea to make it to, most, to help scalability is that we would have a number of blockchains uh, running simultaneously. Um, and so, for example, financial applications may have their own blockchain, um, voting applications may have their blockchain, uh, etc. And generally, the, the idea would be, the, would be that the, uh, these applications would generally just transact, send messages to each to applications on the same blockchain, but would rarely send applications to other blockchains. Though that mechanism would be possible, um, but would be more expensive. Um, Ring signature mixture is just a general account thing, the idea being that uh, to help with anonymity and to allow things like multiple signature wallets and to allow people to uh, send transactions to sign for things without it being too obvious who really did this. So if you're worried um, about uh, sending some funds to, to wherever, for whatever you want to do, um, this, this is a way around it. Uh, micropayments I, I've mentioned already. Um, so yeah, DAOs, we're starting to see them. Um, we will see a lot more of them, hopefully. Consensus applications, um, yeah, also governance. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing all of these things. This does depend to some extent on these next two points, identity and reputation services. So at the moment, uh, I like the idea that I can, uh, say, do some transaction, buy something using Ethereum from some somebody on the Ethereum network. But, okay, I know, I may know that account, uh, I know I can be sure that's coming from a certain account, but I don't know who that is in the real world. It would be nice if I could know that. It would be nice for me to be able to say, this is who I am, this is my digital identity on the blockchain, and I could sign things and say that, uh, you know, this is from me, and uh, I want, uh, I can prove that my identity hasn't been stolen because only I have my private key. Um, so, we are waiting for people to come up with identity services for Ethereum. I think that will be a big step forward when that happens. At the moment, um, there is, uh, if any of you, I don't know if any of you have tried applying for your e-residency for Estonia, um, but that is one way of doing this. Um, you can apply to the Estonian government, they will, you send them some documents, they send you back a card that uh, allows you to set up businesses in Estonia, um, but it also you can get a reader that you can plug in and access, an ident and access a proof of identity. You can put that on the blockchain and, s and prove your identity that way. Reputation services, this would be great. Um, what I was saying earlier about hating um, agencies, um, recruitment agencies, contract agencies, I would love it if my reputation was on the blockchain. So if somebody wanted to employ me, they could look at the blockchain, they could look at my history, and say, well, yes, we'd like to, but your last contract was rubbish, so we're not going to bother, or whatever, you know. But at least it would be there, and, you know, they could see it easily, and they wouldn't have to go through an agency to do this. They could just see what my reputation is like. Uh, with, uh, that. Once we get those two things on the Ethereum network, and we get those starting to be used, I think then that will also, they'll help promote a lot of other applications and make, uh, give people a lot of confidence in using Ethereum. Um, so, yeah, proof of stake, I've already mentioned very briefly. Um, the, uh, the inventor of Ethereum, Vitalik, um, gave that quote about the proof of stake um, that effectively it's going to be a, a prediction market on the blockchain. So, it's, it's quite a complex thing. Um, looking forward to when it happens. Um, that's it. Um, just a couple of. I, unfortunately, I can't do the links. We don't have Wi-Fi. Um, I run the Ethereum, uh, Ox, the, Ox, the Ethereum Meetup Group. Um, so if you're ever in that area, please check us out. Um, for Java uh, developers, uh, the London Java community has a monthly uh, hackathon um, called Hack the Tower. The next one is on June the 11th. Um, for people to go along and uh, hack with Java, I, to some extent, hijack that slightly by running a. Uh, blockchain project in there and looking at the Java client uh, for Ethereum. So if you want to come along and try out any projects using Java in Ethereum, please do. Um, I give introductions to, to Ethereum on that um, and, and the Java client. Um, and 
that gives me time now for questions.